Welcome to College Admissions Toolbox, giving you the edge you need to get into the colleges of your dreams with your host, Steve Schwartz. That's me. Welcome to College Admissions Toolbox, Dan. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Glad to have you here. You've been tutoring for like almost 30 years now, and you start as a grad student. Tell a little bit about yourself. Well, like you said, I basically uh, was one of those people who never knew what I wanted to do with my life. So I ended up uh, in the tutoring business, and I've been doing it for, like you said, almost 30 years. Uh, in college, I changed my major about four times. And when I finished college, I ended up with a degree in sociology, which was really great. I had learned a lot of really quick, great and useful things, uh, but it wasn't particularly practical. So I figured after college, I'd go back to school and become a math teacher. Uh, but along the way, uh, I went, uh, while I was in grad school, I started doing tutoring. And I found out that I really enjoyed the tutoring a lot more than the classroom teaching. So when I got my master's degree, I decided I'd rather just become a tutor and um, ultimately start a business down the road. And so for a couple of years after grad school, I was just tutoring. Uh, then I took a year off and I traveled and I came back and I thought, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. And uh, Started the business in 1992, and we're still doing it, so it's worked out pretty well. Wow, that's really something. You know, you started off in the classroom, and then you transitioned to the private tutoring. What was the pivotal moment when you decided that the classroom wasn't really your style and you were more into the, the, the tutoring, like the one-on-one? -on -one? Well, basically what happened was I was doing a lot of tutoring in grad school just to kind of earn some money. And I really enjoy working with kids one-to-one, -one, even the kids that were struggling, uh, kids with attitude problems. I was just able to really connect with those kids by, you know, using humor and just kind of observing where they were coming from and figuring out what they were, what they were missing and what they needed to, to really get the material. At the same time, when I was in a, a in sort of public school classroom, uh, you know, I felt like it was a lot harder to connect with kids when I had, you know, 25 to 30 kids in the room, some of whom really weren't motivated. And, um, you know, I just kind of felt like if I'm going to spend my time really trying to do something and, and making a difference for kids, that this was much more likely to be uh, something that was going to be gratifying for me. So I, I think I made the right choice. No, absolutely. Sometimes those large class sizes and the unfortunate ratio between teacher and student, you know, isn't always what it should be. So definitely the one-on-one -on -one tutoring can, can be more effective in the end, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the reality is there probably are other people out there that are just, you know, there's so much better at it than I was. Uh, and I was also pretty young at the time, so I probably you know, looking back on it now, I may have been a little bit hard on myself. Uh, but, you know, I definitely felt like this was much more my element. So it's, uh, it's been great. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, one thing we really love to hear on College Admissions Toolbox are stories. Could you take us to the moment in time of the worst moment you've experienced in the, you know, the test prep space, you know, and tell us the story behind it, you know, working with a student perhaps? Um, hmm. I mean, I've had students that I've worked with that, uh, you know, unfortunately that the parents get in the way. That's probably one of the worst things is that you really want to help the student. And we live in an era in which sometimes parents are overly involved and they're well-meaning for the most part. But sometimes the parents want to come in and say, you really need to do it this way or that way. And, um, you know, considering I've been doing this for so long and I have so much experience with it, um, you know, I can I, I really have a pretty good sense of what's going to work for students. And so, you know, I I've had situations where, you know, the student decided to go to university in Alaska just to get away from their parents. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> so probably one of the worst things I've seen. And, uh, you know, sometimes parents just really are overly invested in the process. And, and, and I'm sure, as, as you know from, you know, what happens in New York, uh, I think people get overly invested not only in, in the test prep piece, but also getting their kid into a kind of a big name college. Uh, and
And my philosophy is really more about the fit, making sure that you get into the school that's going to make the best, you know, give you the best opportunity to really thrive and be, you know, all that you can be. And that doesn't always mean going to an Ivy League college. Sure, sure. I mean, you want to go somewhere that you're going to be happy in the end, and that isn't always necessarily the highest ranked school that you get into. I, to- yes. I totally agree. Uh, and I, I feel like, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but re- recently Frank Rooney put out a book, and he's been oh, of course. Sort of publicizing it. And yeah. I really think his, he's on the right uh, page with that. I think that I've seen a lot of it over the years where you know, parents really want to get their kids into one of you know a handful of colleges that are well known, uh, so they can you know quote unquote put the bumper sticker on the back of their car, and that's really more about the parent than is it is about the kid. And I think there's probably twenty or thirty great schools out there for most students that would be a really good fit for them. Uh, some of the schools that may not have the same cachet but have the things that, that are really there to provide the student with what they need and what's going to help them out in life. So that's one of my things that I really focus on with parents. Yeah, totally. You've got to consider that factor as well. You've got to make sure you're going to be happy where you go in the end. You touched on something really valuable that I, I want to go a little bit deeper into, which is the idea you know, of you know, parental over-involvement in teaching, you know, in, in tutoring. No, right. You you sometimes you know, you, you know you have all this experience, and the parent you know kind of sometimes thinks they know what's right more than you do. But at the end of the day, you're the one they hire to solve this problem, so they must believe in your expertise. So I'm wondering, what are the steps that you take? You know, could you give us maybe a specific example of a time that a parent tried to get over involved, and you know, you were able to kind of manage that process a bit in order to steer things back in the right direction. What were the steps that you took? Well, for example, uh, what happens a lot here is that a parent will call us uh, and they typically refer to us. Most of our business is referral business. Uh, And so they, like you said before, they have confidence in us because they've been referred to us by uh, another client or by a consultant like yourself or by a school. Uh, so they believe that we'll do a good job. But sometimes parents call and they say, uh, my son or daughter's taking the SAT in a month, and I want their score to go up 200 points in the SAT. So this is what I'd like you to do. And, of course, my reaction to that is we typically work with kids for, you know, three to four months. That's pretty typical for us. And we try to do like a kind of a slow and steady progression with them. So we're working with them. Our tutoring is usually one one session a week for an hour and a half. And then the kids get about two to three hours of homework to do each week. And there's a lot of information for them to incorporate and integrate and, and practice. And it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, and sometimes parents have a hard time understanding that. They just don't, they don't understand it. They think, oh, you can just kind of wave the magic wand. And if we have the time to put in, you know, then you can do that in a month. And the reality is with most of the kids we work with, not only do they have to deal with the test prep, but they've got AP courses, they have sports activities, jobs, a social life. So it all has to be put into perspective and you have to balance it out. So a lot of times you have to kind of coach the parents on the right approach and the timing and making sure that we have the maximum chance for success. So we we spend a lot of time talking to parents about those kinds of issues. Absolutely. You know, planning ahead is so key. You know, trying to cram it in in one month, you know, you're much less likely to get that 200-point increase. That was a really valuable insight there. I like the way you guys structure things of starting three or four months out, once a week, gradually building that skill set to ultimately lead to success on test day. Yeah, we've been very successful with that approach, and we have a lot of very satisfied and happy clients. Uh, Obviously, we don't have a guarantee. We can't guarantee success, but generally speaking, if people do it the way, you know, we designed the program, uh, they usually have pretty good results, and, and the clients are happy. So it's a lot of times when, you know, we have to go over that with parents, explain to them how it works. And sometimes we end up, you know, turning away business because we're not going to 
put a program in place that we don't think has a really high chance of success. You know, we'd rather work with the kids in a way that's really going to be helpful to them um, rather than just take a client on because they, they want to, you know, pay us to do this. If we don't think it's going to be the right approach, we're not going to do it. Sure, sure, absolutely. You don't want to take on something that isn't going to be realistic. What would you say was like, you know, one instance that happened recently or one instance that particularly stands out? What was the parent looking for? Uh, well, sometimes what happens is, um, you know, like, like I was saying before, they don't know this field. Right? They're an expert at something else. So, uh, you know, parents think, oh, well, I just want you to, you know, do a couple of sessions with my, my son or daughter. And I'm sure that their score is going to go up X amount if you do that. And maybe they're just trying to get them into a school, like I said earlier, that's not exactly the best fit for them. Uh, or maybe they're not taking into account the fact that the kid's way too busy with activities. Um, so, you know, I had a situation like that recently where a parent contacted me and once they told me all the activities the kid was involved with, you know, with the, with the band and um, all the AP courses and, you know, everything else, you know, I told them, I really think you ought to wait and do this later on. Like, don't start something now. Let's wait until, you know, later in July or August, and then we can push forward and really help the student prepare for a test in the fall where they're going to have much more time to put in it, into it over the summer. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to prepare when you have the time available to do it properly. If you've got a million things on your plate, adding test prep to the equation, you know, you're not going to get the same results in the end. I absolutely agree. That's a really valuable insight there. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. Uh, you're welcome. I, mean, I think, you know, that's a big part of what we have to do is, you know, we really like, you know, working with the kids. They're really great. And we have to kind of make it clear to parents that you sometimes have to clear the path a little bit, you know, that you can't do everything. There's only so many hours in the day, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, you got to just be realistic in the end and figure out what your schedule looks like. Because obviously, it's not just about the time you spend with the tutor. There's also that homework that you got to be doing. What would you say is like a, a good ratio of time during a session with, with a tutor versus time studying on your own? Generally speaking, the way we do things, the students are going to spend uh, probably twice as much time doing homework as they will in the tutoring sessions themselves. So if we're meeting with a student for an hour and a half a week, they're probably going to have, you know, in the neighborhood of three hours of homework to do between the tutoring sessions. Uh, and that's going to be working on uh, just basic skills that they need to prepare, um, working on learning strategies. And then taking the actual, you know, practice tests uh, that, you know, you really have to have experience with, you know, looking at the real thing so that when you go to take the test on test day, uh, everything is kind of second nature. You've seen it many times before, you know. So, yeah, you have to have that time. Sometimes what happens is, you know, we talk to parents about everything that's going on with the students and we say, let's try to, maybe find a time where you can kind of pair that back a little bit so they'll take a semester off of doing something while they're going to do test prep, you know, where they'll, they won't have that job this term, you know, because otherwise they're just not going to have time and it's not going to be successful and they're going to be incredibly stressed out. Absolutely. Finding that balance is so important. you got to weigh and measure what you have going on in order to figure out you know, the right time to pursue your, you know, your SAT or ACT prep. Absolutely. Really, really. Yeah, and if you're, if you're a teenager, you're, you know, many teenagers don't have the best time management skills. I think that's something that you learn over time. You definitely learn more about that as you go through college and get a little bit older. So, uh, I mean, it's the exceptional teenager that's really on top of that. So sometimes you need sort of an outside voice helping them understand and, and planning those kinds of things. Absolutely. So, I mean, you work with a lot of students, you work with a lot of teenagers, and I know our listeners out there, a lot of them have, you know, feel like they have their plates full. Could you give us an example of, a, of one of those exceptional teens that you encountered who was able to balance it all? And, you know, what were some of the 
habits or tricks they use to kind of keep it all together? Well, I think it's important to remember that every kid is different and there's no one size fits all solution. Uh, for example, uh, some kids are really great at using uh, either a mobile phone or, uh, you know, sort of like a Google Calendar type of thing to keep track of all their appointments. Uh, and then you have other kids who basically use their, like, their planner book, and that's kind of their, you know, their sort of central command center, and they can just put everything in there. Um, I, like you said, I mean, it, it, there are some exceptional kids that are really well organized and on top of things. Uh, that's not the norm. But I think the important thing to remember as a parent and also as a tutor is that you have to work with each individual student and help them, you know, figure out the way that's going to work best for them. You know, it, it, there's just no way to know what's the best fit for a particular student. Sometimes there's some trial and error involved. And, um, you know, for example, some people need to have like a lot of reminders set because they know that they're just not going to remember to do things, you know, whereas other people are just much more organized. Yeah, totally. I mean, some people out there, some of us are ADD, you know, ADD, ADHD, and have right. you know, a million things going on at once and trying to multitask. Other people have that laser focus. So you've got to find the technique that works for you. There's not really going to be a one size fits all solution. But definitely two th- you know, two you know, tools that you know, students should definitely consider are something like Google Calendar or just using the old fashioned, you know, pen and paper planner, but you got to keep it written down. You know, you got to schedule things out. You know, you got so much going on. Don't try to hold it all in your head. You don't need to. You don't need to take on that additional stress because then things are going to slip through the cracks. It happens, you know, it happens to me if I'm not good about writing stuff down. And I'm sure right. it happens to you, Dan, if you don't write something down when it's happening, you're a busy guy. That's right. And I think the thing is we have to keep in mind as professionals and as parents that these are still just kids. They look like adults, but they're still kids. So they, they need us to understand sometimes and to help coach them when they slip, you know, rather than expecting perfection and, and then sort of coming down on them. We have to say, okay, you made a mistake. This is a learning experience for you. You're still growing and maturing. So let's try to move forward from here. That's a really important aspect of the whole thing as well. Yeah, definitely. It's about learning from your mistakes and, and growing from them. If you get that, you know, you know, that one practice test on the SAT that where the score isn't where you want it to be, you know, just regroup, learn from your mistakes, figure it out for next time. And maybe that practice test didn't go well because you didn't have time to do the homework that week. So just always look back at what was the reason that things didn't work out this time learn from your mistakes, grow from them. It's never the end of the world. And, you know, constant improvement, you know, it's really a, you know, it's really a lifelong process. So definitely keep that in mind. Right. Super important. Yeah. Another, that reminds me of another thing that we see pretty commonly here, which it may not surprise you, but uh, a lot of times, like I say, kids are so busy. They'll literally do these practice tests at like midnight. You know, so they're like, oh, I have to get my homework done. So I'm going to take this practice test at, you know, they finally get to it at midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And, you know, not surprisingly, they do not do well. And so then they're disappointed. And that's, again, it's another opportunity to talk to them about their time management and planning. And don't beat yourself up over it, but that's not going to work for you. You know, and then, you know, those are the kinds of things that you have to kind of deal with and help them, you know, work through. No, totally. I mean, I encounter so many people, you know, they're, they're, they're burning the candle at both ends, trying to do homework at, you know, midnight, one, two, three in the morning, trying to do those, that SAT prep homework at that time of night. And the quality of the work is not going to be where your full potential really lies. You know, it's not just about the quantity of the problems that you're working through. It's also the quality of the hours that you're putting in, you know, I would say you're better off getting sleep maybe between the hours of midnight and 3 a.m. and then saving that homework and saving that practice test for the time that you're really going to be able to put your fullest energy into it because you know three hours in the middle of the night is not equivalent to three hours in the afternoon or in the morning on the weekend. You know you don't want to feel like you're putting in three hours, period, and then not getting the results. It's going to be frustrating. 
You know, you don't need, you don't need right. to do that. You don't need to, you know, destroy yourself just to get that done. You know, again, planning ahead, using the calendar, your Google calendar, using the planner. Those are some tools that can prevent you from ultimately feeling like you need to squeeze it all in at the last second. And then, you know, your work isn't where it you know, actually could be in the end. You could have done a lot better. That's right. So that's the situation that happens sometimes. And as, you know, like I said before, as, as professionals and as parents, you know, we, did, we need to help kids with these things. And sometimes it's certain things that seem obvious to us as adults aren't necessarily obvious to teenagers, uh, including this issue and including sometimes the fact, like you said, they're burning the candle at both ends and you have to actually examine what you're doing, how you're using your time, are you being effective uh, or are you doing things that are, you know, just kind of a waste of time or you're just kind of spinning your wheels, you know, and sometimes you don't really know what those kinds of issues are going to be uh, with a particular student until you're actually starting to work with them and, and you deal with them as they come up. Exactly. You've got to really individualize it. Look at the individual student or that you're working with or, you know, that you're parenting and, you know, really figure out what works best for them. You know, a tip that you read online or read in a book, you could try it and you could evaluate whether it might work for that particular student. But, you know, not everything works for everyone all the time. That's right. And also any, any parent will tell you, any parent that has more than one child will tell you how different each of their kids are. So the approach is going to be different for, you know, their first child than for their second or their third child. So it really comes down to sort of learning about that individual and what they need. And again, it comes back to this idea that it's not going to be the same for everybody. Uh, and that reminds me of another thing, you know, based on the way we do things, uh, I really believe in the one-to-one tutoring. And, you know, when you're, tu- when you're working in a group situation, in a test prep group, uh, one of the reasons it's not as effective as one-to-one, besides the fact that, in the one-to-one, you can obviously tailor the instruction to the individual student. Uh, the other aspect that makes it more effective is the accountability factor, that a student is accountable specifically to their tutor, uh, as opposed to you know being able to kind of blend into the woodwork if you're sitting in a group. And that's a really important component as well. Oh, definitely. I mean, I see it all the time, people taking you know the test prep classes. You know, students can slip through the cracks. You know, if someone does question or doesn't get answered, the concept, and there's no time for it, the concept doesn't get covered. You know, there's even, you know, one instance I saw where during an in-class practice test, one kid was copying off another kid's bubble sheet. And this was a practice test. (laughs) There weren't really any stakes involved, but that's not going to happen during a private tutoring session. You are going to be held accountable. The tutor is going to see, are you able to actually solve that problem or not? You know, the kid who copied off the other kid, you know, he walks home you know, tells his parents, hey, look, I got a 2300 on my practice SAT. I'm going to go out this weekend instead of studying. You know, who knows how that kid would have done without, without the cheating. That's right. So, I mean, that really, uh, you know, brings up two things. One is, um, you know, that kid is actually being very ineffective. They're just wasting their time. You know, the limited time that they do have, you know, what are they doing with it? That's not helping them at all, you know. Um, and the second thing is, you know, that the one-to-one is more effective in general uh, because it's so much more tailored, because of the accountability. Now, I realize not everybody can afford one-to-one tutoring. I would say that a group program is better than not doing anything, you know, and it also leads to, uh, you know, the other question about the motivation of the student. If you have an extremely motivated student, uh, they could actually study independently and get a lot of benefit. You know, they might also need some instruction from a, from a professional who knows the tests, but a lot of the benefit of tutoring or a group program is the structure we provide. You know, So it, it's, a, it's really a combination of elements that leads to success, but because we've been doing it so long, I feel like we have a pretty good handle on what those things are, and if it's not working for a particular student, we can make adjustments so that it will ultimately be successful. Exactly. The ability to adjust and be flexible is so key. You know, a lot of kids, you know, they 
They take the SAT once. They don't go about it in the way that's optimal for them. And then, you know, they, they're going to retake it. And so when you're going to retake it, you got to think about what can you change in your approach from time number one, you know, to time number two. What can you do differently? What wasn't working the first time that you can change up for the next go at it? That's right, exactly. So that's where the practice really comes in. I mean, most of our students will take, you know, five or six practice tests before they sit for the real thing. So by the time they're taking the real test, they will have figured all that stuff out. So they'll know what their approach should be. Uh, now that's possible. They'll still have a bad day because the pressure will get to them. But in most cases, that level of preparation really provides a lot of comfort and confidence. Definitely. Now I want to shift gears a little bit. Dan. I want to. You know, you've worked with you know tons of students. You've been doing this for decades. I want you to take us to the moment in time. You know, you were working with a particular student, and they had some sort of moment of insight. You know, like a light bulb moment that led them on the path to success, that led them to get that massive score increase on the SAT or ACT. Could you share with us that story? So what was that light bulb moment? <laughs> yeah, what, 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 was that flat, yeah, what was that insight that led them to, you know, to, to make that score increase, to make it all click? You know, what happens is, um, you know, I, I've had this definitely with, with a lot of students, Generally speaking, if you haven't really looked at these tests before and you're, you know, you're a high school student coming into it, you're used to taking tests in class. So when you take your test in class, it's generally pretty straightforward. You know, your teacher's been teaching you something and they're asking you to use those skills on this test. Uh, and you generally have to answer all the questions on the test. You're not going to skip any questions. Uh, and another thing is you're basically following sort of recipe that the teacher provided for you for the most part. When you take one of these standardized tests, uh, a lot of times you can use different kinds of tricks or maybe even, let's say, work the problem backwards from the answer choices or plug in your own numbers into the problem, which is something you really wouldn't be doing in your regular classes. So sometimes at first kids are like, you know, that doesn't make any sense. How could I take a test and not answer every question? Or how can I make up my own numbers in the problem? So those kinds of things, there's, there's actually sort of an inherent barrier that's set up there at first until they realize how different these tests are than what they're used to seeing. And they kind of let that guard down a little bit and they say, okay, I'll try that. And then all of a sudden they start to see success because they see that some of these strategies really are making a difference for them. And that gives them a boost of confidence to push forward. And, and a lot of times that's where you see it. Yeah, absolutely. Learning those, learning those valuable standardized test tricks, you know, they're things you're not going to, you're not going to get in the classroom when they're taking a more standard approach. That's right. I mean, it's just a different environment. It's a different situation. And, um, you know, for example, if you're taking an algebra test and I'm just speaking on the math side, cause that's what I know, the math portion, um, if you're taking a, a test in algebra and you, your teacher asks, you know, to ask you to answer a certain question, they're going to be looking at your work. They're going to be looking at the technique you use. They're not just going to, you know, want to see the answer. They're going to want to see the work. You could have a similar problem on one of these standardized tests, and you could use some, some shortcuts and get the answer more quickly and, and maybe in a more direct way. But that wouldn't be appropriate and on a, on a regular school tests. So the way we talk about it is that would be quote unquote the proper way of doing the, this algebra problem. But you don't have to do the proper way on the SAT or the ACT. You just have to get the right answer. Yeah, totally. For the SAT, ACT, the best way is the way that works. The proper way is the way that gets you to the correct answer as quickly as possible. You know, if you learn it, if there's a shortcut that works, there's no, there's no shame in using that. Absolutely. That's right. And what I say to students is, you know, you look at a particular problem and you, there's two options. There's a brute force approach, which is going to be like, you know, you just do every possible calculation to get the answer, but that's going to take you a long time. Or you can look for the short, elegant solution. Uh, and that's the one that the test makers are actually, 
you know, sort of designing the question that if you see it, you'll do that. And that's one of the things we really try to teach kids how to do is to see that short, elegant solution rather than just kind of, you know, turning their mind off, just trying to calculate it. Absolutely. It's all about reading between the lines, not just, you know, doing a bunch of busy work. There is often a faster, more efficient way. And with your SAT and ACT prep, it's all about learning those strategies in order to solve the questions as efficiently as possible. Right. You learn the strategies and that's just why, you know, exposure is so important because, you know, you're, it's not going to occur to you if you've never seen it before and you just have to learn how to spot those things. Um, and, and it just takes practice to get that. And students need to understand that. And it comes kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier in the conversation. That's not going to happen overnight. And that's not going to happen if the parent says, my kid's taking the test in a month. You know, let's just kind of shove it down their throat. No, you've got to take your time, give them a chance to digest all this stuff, try it out, learn from their mistakes, and keep moving forward. So it, the whole process, just, it takes time. It's not, uh, you can't just snap your fingers and make it happen. No, absolutely, Dan. That's such a valuable nugget. The idea of, you know, really a massive change in your mindset, a shift. It's like a, a seismic, cosmic shift in your thinking between the way that you learn in the classroom and what you've got to be doing for the standardized test because it's a totally different approach. In school, a lot of the times, it is just about the brute force. But when you're taking that standardized test, you've got to learn the tricks. You've got to learn the shortcuts. And that's not going to happen in a week or a month. It's going to happen in at least a couple of months of really dedicated time devoted to this to learn that different way of thinking. So thank you so much for sharing that, Dan. I want to shift gears now and move into the lightning round where I'm going to ask you some rapid-fire questions. You give me some rapid-fire responses. Are you ready? I think so. I, can I phone a friend or no? <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> you got your hot seat right now. Okay. What's, what's your number one piece of advice for the college admissions process? Number one piece of advice is to look for the school that's the best fit don't necessarily just go with a name because it's so well-known and everybody's going to be impressed by it. Absolutely. Really important to keep in mind. Could you share with us one habit that you believe contributes to success? A habit that contributes to success? Um, I guess like you said earlier, I mean, just write everything down. You know, don't rely on your memory. You have to write things down to stay organized. That planning and that note-taking is so key. Can you share with us one online college admissions resource that you absolutely love? Uh, I've, I've, over the years, I've looked at College Confidential, and I think there's a lot of good information there. And it's also a nice place for students to share you know, their thoughts on the process. Definitely. It's a good one. We'll link to it in the show notes. What's one book that you believe no college applicant should be without? One book? Hmm. Yeah, book. Question. Uh, I think the Fisk Guide is a very good book. There's a lot of great stuff in there about the different colleges. And it's just, you know, it's more of a starting point, but helps you kind of identify the initial list of colleges you might be interested in. Totally. It's a great resource. What, and, you know, what, what are you up to these days? What are you working on? Anything coming up in the pipeline? Well, the big thing right now is that the SAT is changing. So that's occupying a lot of our time and, you know, thinking about it and trying to communicate with students and parents uh, because of the fact that the SAT is coming out with a, a new test in the PSAT will be new in October and then the SAT itself will be new in March. Uh, we're working with the current crop of 10th graders, the class of 2017, and really encourage them to, them to take either the existing SAT before it changes or to take the ACT and, and really encouraging people not to take the new SAT until it's been around for a while because I think there are going to be a lot of uh, issues with it when it first comes out. Oh, definitely. I mean, who knows what that's going to bring. Better to get it out of the way now if you can or just avoid it altogether. Totally. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's the big thing that's happening right now because the college board, uh, I think, was under a lot of pressure to revise the test and to get it out. And I think the 
they're, you know, kind of rushing to get it out by a certain timeline. But for the first crop of kids who's going to face that test, there's not going to be a lot of great material available to help them prepare because as it stands now, it's May 1st. And so far, the College Board has only put out one practice PSAT. And even the one practice PSAT they put out for the new test, you can't even get a score on it. All you can do is see whether you got the questions right or wrong. So the closer we get to these tests actually being administered, you know, the, the, the more it's, it's starting to look like those students that are going to see that test, at least the first group of students, are going to have a, you know, a very, very small pool of, of tests and test questions to use to prepare. So we're really telling them, you know, for this group of kids, just I would wait, wait a little while and, and, and take one of the other tests, you know, if you can. Definitely. You know, you, it's so important to use lots of practice tests in your studying. And if there aren't that many available, you're really doing yourself a disservice. So definitely avoid being in that situation if you can. Yeah. And one of the things that's happening is that some of the, uh, the big test prep companies that are out there are, uh, you know, going into schools and saying, look, we have a, a practice test you can take, you know, for the new PSAT or the new SAT. And, you know, I really think they're doing a disservice to the students that they're offering those tests to because there's no way they could possibly be accurate at this point. There just isn't enough information available. So we're really trying to let people know that that's really a bad idea. Uh, and the information they get from those kinds of practice tests uh, is probably going to be very unreliable. Yeah, definitely. Just not enough out there. But it was so great having you on the show, Dana. Any final thoughts before you go? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And, uh, you know, I hope this information is useful for your listeners. So thank you. No, my, my pleasure. Glad to have you on. Uh, where can folks find you online? Yes, they can find us at www.aplustutoring.com. That's all spelled out. So it's A P L U S T U T. O-R-I-N-G dot com. And also note that even if you're not in the Philadelphia area where we're located, uh, we do have a really wonderful online tutoring platform that we've actually developed ourselves that allows us to meet with students just about anywhere in the world and work with them face-to-face online. So if you're interested in it, uh, you know, take a look at our website and give us a call. Definitely. All right, Dan. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to College Admissions Toolbox. Head over to www.collegeadmissionstoolbox.com to get more free tools and resources that will help you get into the colleges of your dreams.